to say our opinion, to participate, and to engage with government. So I think we have to work together, in, in, I'm particularly addressing the Southeast Asian context, and make our governments in ASEAN to respond to this kind of concerns and issues. Um, is there a we need to, somewhere in the policy discourse and in the rights sort of discourse, define what it is not, right? Just criticizing a politician to call that hate speech is just meaningless in my opinion. So that's one. And the second thing is, um, you know, because that's how people then start to understand hate speech. And then it becomes very much restrictive of freedom of expression. The second thing that I wanted to say is that I think as users of the internet who are sort of looking to sort of, you know, have our rights sort of respected, protected, upheld, whatever, when we use the internet. I feel like we are stuck between two things. One is policy, which is made at a government level, and terms of use of companies, which actually, of major websites, which actually represent their policies, and which affect us daily as users. And the thing is, we have no clue about whether these terms of use actually um, adhere to any right standards at all, right? They vary from company to company, and of course I'm not talking about every single website in the world, but if we were to just look at the first 10, it would be interesting to see whether these actually uphold human rights, like where, how these sort of relate to human rights standards, and it would be interesting for, I think it would be increasingly important for policymakers to seriously consider how corporations which are giant policymakers but unrecognized on the internet can adhere to human rights standards. now. Here in front, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Xian Honghu from UNESCO. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I particularly I have heard so many uh, opinions from uh, local, from Asian, from Indonesian. Uh, I particularly on women issues, on gender, I'd like to share a little bit uh, what my organization, UNESCO, is doing because uh, it is a complex issue, as we all mentioned, at the policy level, at the capacity building level, a normative level. And we are, um, we are, our responsibility is really to keep our governments, our member states, responsible to to align them with the international standards on those uh, human rights, including women's rights, gender equality, in the in their policy making uh, related to internet. Uh, but uh, in the um, in the reality, it's really very difficult to, to reach. Uh, a sort of uh, understanding and uh, consensus on um, many of them. Uh, because on the internet, uh, everything is related to uh, each other. You cannot uh, just say, uh, for example, human rights. Oh, our major uh, mandate is on the freedom expression. But uh, as, we, as we have seen in reality, it's related to so many other challenges uh, and rights human rights, uh, free expression, and uh, privacy, for example. When we uh, try to discuss among our member states, we found that uh, on one side we said uh, free expression on the internet uh, should be equally protected as we did in the reality. But uh, on the other side, the many governments said that uh, nowadays that it seems that the states and uh, also individuals, they have lost their control of their uh, personal data and the information. And then we, we, we realize that these two rights, they are related and they, their relation is tricky. Sometimes on the internet, they support each other. For example, the right to be anonymous 
a, a support for inspiration. You can speak more uh, freely when you are not identified. But sometimes they are also competing and uh, conflicting, uh, particularly for women that uh, in many cases, their identity, including their personal uh, gender and uh, uh, orientation information can be exposed, uh, disclosed on the internet, which could be uh, threatening in, in, a, in a sense. So, so it's um, so uh, we we did a global survey on the policy and the regulatory framework in the, at a global level. Uh, yes, the existing global international standard is there, is ready. But uh, if you look into the different uh, contexts in different countries, uh, they don't. Uh, many of them, they don't. Uh, they may have a constitutional. Mm, standard, yes, a free expression, women's rights, but uh, at the level of criminal law and the civil law, there are many uh, vacuum in in personal, uh, in the privacy yeah. and also uh, hate speech. There, there's an absence, and uh, at the level of uh, company, corporation, self-regulatory framework, uh, that even worse in many uh, countries, in many companies, they don't really have a very effective protections on that, the privacy protection. Um, the Facebook is really an example. You, you give out all your privacy to them. And uh, at the level of um, individual, um, we see uh, even for those educated uh, population, they don't really, uh, they don't, they are not very, very much aware of the risks and skills, their lack of the competence to, to use, to interact on internet with, with, uh, with sufficient uh, skills and the ethical standard and the competence. So, so, so these are all what we are trying to do. So we have done, um, at the policy level, we, uh, we do the research, we study the, uh, the different uh, law, uh, legislation, and, and the policies to, to inform, to sensitize our member states to the governments, as you all feel that the governments have the responsibility. But the governments also need to learn to, to know what exactly happening. And they are also uh, feel challenged uh, at many uh, issues. Uh, when they will talk about the privacy to them, they say, look at uh, following Snowden that uh, sure. the national security has been threatened. <laughs> we are Shine, also- Is it okay to, you, you know, to okay, yeah, wrap it up? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So we can uh, give I a little bit more time for others. Thank yeah, you. So, uh, so the strategy for us, uh, the first of all, is a way with, I think we should have really have a holistic, uh, very comprehensive framework to look at each particular issues. You cannot just uh, focus one thing without uh, thinking of other yes. things. We need a harmony of all these human rights. Second thing, I think the, uh, the at the capacity level, we uh, we need uh, we really need a, need a package of the toolkits we can we can provide to our different stakeholders. We have done a, a media information literacy toolkit, which cater for the both the Thank trainers you. and trainees. And also, we have the gender indicator. To, to measure the development of media and, and ICTs at all levels, not just uh, to, to fight against the gender stereotype at all levels. Uh, if it was the media or ICT, we will see uh, not only the content, but also the, um, the production process. It's women uh, equally participating in the management and development of this media content and applications. So, so it's really a, a full package work which we should uh, pick up uh, holistically. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think Johan, you wanted to respond to the uh, question on hate speech. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to comment on uh, the comment from from my, my friend from India, uh, and I, I'm, I very much agree with what you say. I think there is a there is a risk when when we use the word hate speech that that it all of a sudden it includes everything that we don't like. And this is clearly something we need to work with. And I think we have a, a quite a lot of, quite a lot of um, uh, um, information and, and leadership to find in international law. Uh, and I think that's where we should start. We, we, need to, we need to accept that freedom of expression also includes expression that shock, disturb, and offend. And this is important to remember. However, 
what is illegal and what clearly is, is within the realm of, of hate speech is not allowed offline and not allowed, certainly not online. But we need to be able to, to address it in, a, in an effective way. Is law lacking? Well, then establish law. Is law there? Make it work. This is quite simple. And I also get um, a little bit disturbed um, about, in, in, in the same manner, I think you enter into a slippery slope when you start to leave rights language and start to talk about ethics. Uh, to me, this, uh, this is clearly a slippery slope because ethics is a concept which is very undefined uh, in, in law. It does not give you a, a direction of, of, of um, justiciability. You, you can't make it work in court. And this is a concept that is used for political purposes. It doesn't say anything about um, your claims or, or rights. So it makes me worried when I see the use of, of, of the concept of ethics instead of rights. Clearly, some platforms, uh, private platforms, they, they limit human rights. And once you enter them, you also basically give up some of, some of your human rights. If Facebook has a policy not to show certain pictures that really are part of your freedom of expression, according to international law, then you effectively give that right away, right? So that is basically what you're doing. Is that a violation of human rights law? No, not really. You do this clearly, consciously, you know what you're doing. However, of course, states has responsibility if there are violations on human rights taking place on Facebook against Precisely, you know, I think there are the state responsibility. And in some cases, the state will exercise their mandate. But in, others, in other cases of human rights violation, they won't. I think we see that. It depends on what it is. So there are two hands here. Yes, please introduce yourself. Yeah, 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 you. And then Val Valentina after. Thank you very much. My name is Gigi Alford, and I work at Freedom House, based in Washington, D.C. And I uh, really have appreciated all the, the comments that um, have gone before me and all the comments from the panel. Uh, the, the title of this workshop I thought was really fantastic about connecting our rights. And I can see now it's not just about how uh, you know, the rights we enjoy online enable so many of the other rights that uh, we hold so dearly, but it's also talking about where that connective tissue sometimes leads to, leads to a little bit of uh, conflict that we have to figure out w what balance to use to resolve them. And uh, to this point about uh, really staying within the rights language, it's very empowering to do that. And I, I think it's really important to highlight examples of when uh, exercising those rights. So, for example, when someone exercising their uh, right to free expression um, might lead to uh, speech that offends, how that can be uh, remedied with more speech. And there are three examples um, over the last year in the United States that I thought were very interesting, not only because it shows how uh, the internet is enabling uh, more right to freedom of religion, more right to freedom of sexual choice, um, and also enabling the, um, the kind of elimination of racism to really come to the fore. Uh, so just very quickly to go through those. Um, Cheerios made a, a commercial uh, that showed a biracial couple. And uh, this, this commercial was posted on YouTube and the comments that ensued uh, were very offensive, incredibly offensive. Um, but then what happened was very interesting. So uh, to respond to that, the blogosphere just erupted with a discussion about how um, you know, clearly racism still exists in America, and this was a society that was trying to talk about a post-racist society. Um, and having this example come to the fore really enabled uh, the communities to discuss. And then uh, soon after, a parody uh, commercial was actually posted. And it basically copied the entire script of the commercial, except at the end, instead of a you know, black father and a white mother, it was actually two mothers, a black mother and a white mother. And it was really just showing that we need to get over all of our different barriers and all of our different prejudices. 
Um, another one was uh, when the Miss America uh, winner was announced. She was an Indian American. And on Twitter, there was so much criticism. Um, and actually, a lot of it was uh, just incorrect racism, too. They uh, couldn't identify her religion. They couldn't identify her nationality. Uh, but again, it really showed that this hate exists offline. And uh, then you know, being able to talk about it online was actually quite um, helpful and quite empowering. And again, you know, just uh, hitting back at hate speech with more speech. Uh, and then the third is um, a very interesting um, service that I'm sure you're all familiar with, which is Reddit, which often I mean, throughout uh, the years has been identified as sort of a, a cesspool for um, very offensive uh, ideas and, and language. Um, but really a, a clear demonstration of what you know, the um, full exercise of free speech can, can lead to. Well, uh, it was back to school time and a college student posted um, a photo of a fellow student who was a Sikh woman and uh, made some, some very unflattering comments about her. And then what happened afterwards was very amazing. Um, she goes on Reddit and actually responds in a very kind way, very beautiful language. And um, then the original poster actually responded in kind, apologized, and said, you know, um, really, that was a, a teachable moment for him. Um, and actually, uh, a couple other um, scenarios over the you know, next few months uh, happened, and then the co-founder of Reddit also spoke up to, to take a stance. So the one thing I really wanted to kind of tie those three uh, threads together was, um, if anything, we need to recognize that because the internet allows all of this free speech and allows us to see the internal conversations that are happening within groups, it's really showing us what has been there. And so it's not that we need to blame the, the device that's um, bringing you know, this to light. Uh, it's almost that we need to, to use it for the power that it's showing us of the you know, hate and ideas that are out there and then also using it to combat. So we can find these examples of where groups have um, you know, used rights kind of frameworks to, to respond in kind and to really change the debate. And that's going to be the transformation, the education, and the enabling of the rights that you know, the, the power of the internet sort of holds. So you're not bringing in just the mechanisms, but really the recognition of people to use their rights on the spaces. Valentina. I think you're high, high up. I'll that one. To Valentina Bosnia-Herzegovina, feminist internet activist. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank all uh, the panelists that have been really, really inspirational. I think that we are in a new world of narrative when we are into the internet, because it's not this happening, what is happening uh, outside. If you are an AHV person, if you are an LGBT, if you are a minority group of any kind, you will be bullied, at least. Uh, but what I would like to say when we were talking, it's, it's very good, very important that we frame into the rights. But still, if we look at limits to rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 29, we say that among the limits, there is uh, a meeting of the just requirements of morality, public order, and general welfare. So we would like to frame in terms of rights, and especially at the national level, it's really important to focus on rights. This is what we have all in common, all the groups. But we are constantly pushed into this just morality. Morality is far, even far more challenging than ethics. And so this morality is entering the legislation, because whenever it's about public order, whenever it's about pornography, all this stuff, the morality is there to hunt down each and every one that is different. And the morality becomes physically aggressive. I face this, and I think all the people that were talking here, they were talking about something that starts online or expressed online and very often finish in physical attack. So how we can manage and how we can limit also this, uh, this expansion of morality. And one notice regarding Facebook, is it a contractual relation? But it's not a contractual, contractual, equal contractual relation. I can say yes or no. If I say no, I'm outside. All these small letters are done in a way that I cannot go through all of them. It's a commodification of rights. 
I don't like Facebook, but all the civil society of Bosnia and Herzegovina is on Facebook. If I want to be there, to lobby, to talk, to advocate, I have to accept that it's an equal concern. And my state or some other state will have agreement with these uh, big contractors and commodificate my rights even less because they will decide what to hand down. They will go really narrowly to that specific page that has to go down. We had a press conference and we had been threatened because it was about LGBT rights, it was a coming out, and came five young fascists that threatened us all. In 10 minutes, we know who they were. The police will not know. They will not look into the Facebook. They will not look at the audio recording. They will not do a simple research. But if we protest, they will know who are our address. They will reveal our handle. So it, there are too many layers, and I think that the rights is the only frame we have as activists. But they use morality, they use a, a closed-door agreement, how we make this working. Thank you. We have one more hand here, and then we can... This part. Oh, and we have more hands now. <laughs> okay, that part. I think there's one more mic around so that it, we can move faster. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Godwin uh, with Internews. Uh, one of the things that, uh, by the way, this has been a very, very uh, interesting and informative uh, uh, discussion, not just from the panelists, but also from the other contributors here who are attendees. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've noticed in, in, in my work uh, on, uh, on, on Internet-related uh, human rights, which I've been doing now for uh, around 25 years, has been that um, governments tend to react to uh, 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 social adoption of the internet by passing prohibitions. They, the, the instinct is to say, here's, this, here's the internet, the internet poses certain risks and problems, and the beginning impulse of government, uh, really of any government, uh, whether it's uh, uh, you know, uh, an ostensibly democratic government or governments of, of more closed societies, the reaction is first to pass prohibitions. Uh, and one of the things that I would like to see emerge uh, is, uh, is the impulse for governments to speak first to the Internet in terms of uh, uh, positive rights guarantees, uh, expressly recognizing uh, 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 Internet-related human rights as the baseline for understanding what all following regulation uh, and, 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 and criminal laws and other uh, legal prohibitions uh, have to be measured against. So human rights has, has, has to be, there has to be a beginning, the human rights framework. And I noticed that uh, 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 entertainingly, one of my colleagues here is also from the Philippines. I know that in the Philippines, uh, you know, you've you've had the you had the Cyber Crime Act of 2012, uh, which laid out which was laid out a lot of prohibitions, and then a lot of the reaction has been to come back and say, no, we really ought to have rights on the internet, and that maybe is a thing that we should focus on in the Philippines. And, and the same thing, by the way, has happened also in in Brazil, and it's happening elsewhere around the world. Um, and it's the nature of rights guarantees that. Um, of human rights instruments that when you start guaranteeing human rights, there are always people who will use those rights abusively. Uh, and that, I think, touches on the hate speech uh, issue. But, but, but having said all that, I, I wonder if we can begin to form a consensus as uh, activists, as participants in civil society, as representatives of governments or representatives of companies that we all have to begin with a baseline of rights guarantees and measure everything we do against that, those standards. Very good point. We have two more hands, and I'll, I'll, let's do that, and then we can some, some have some responses from from the floor and from the floor and also from the panel. Yeah, at the back there. I think that's Nisa, and then on the end. Thank you. My name is Nisa from Women's Solidarity for Human Rights Indonesia. Well, I want to add something in Indonesia context, but maybe we can uh, get the learn also from other countries. Um, yes, I agree that 
uh, government should be responsible uh, to guarantee our rights in the internet. But what happened in Indonesia uh, in terms of protection? Uh, we have the law on 2008 about like internet and electronic transition. But that law finally used for criminalized citizen like bloggers, women human rights defender, students, etc. who speak out on the internet, who critics who critics to the government on or others. In the other hand, like Kamel mentioned before, we don't have any mechanism or any infrastructure for uh, enforce that be really able to enforce the cyber crime or online trafficking or others. So um, we have to see like two dimension of uh, rights on the internet. So maybe you can, uh, I can get the suggestion from the panel or, or also for the, from the other participants. What kind of law or if you have any experience how the law have a clear definition or, or clear regulation so it can be, be able to protect us but it won't violate our rights.